Take your Bible, turn to Psalm 79, and then to Psalm 102, and then to Acts 16, and then 1 Corinthians 6, and then Psalm 142, and then I'll, I'll help you out as we go along. Uh, yesterday, um, I, and I'm not going to give names because I'm going to let God just let them keep their blessing, but uh, yesterday was Twin City Day. And um, some people came to me and wanted to know if they could have a, we could have a booth there representing our church. And uh, so I said, yeah. I said, you know, I won't be able to be there with you. I'll be with Lisa. And they said, no, we understand that. We just want to do that for our church. And um, so they had a booth and they were setting up to give out DVDs of the things that we do here. And I, and I think I'm going to probably get the number wrong, so if you were there, don't correct me because I don't want anybody to know who you were because I want God to give you a greater blessing. Somewhere around the neighborhood of like 1,500 DVDs given out yesterday. And um, those DVDs, they're not just song and dance shows that I do. They are the sermons I preach, the Watchman broadcasts I do, Pastor Mike online things uh, that I do. And uh, by the way, Cubby, I think I made your DVD, but remind me after church, because I, I, it's been a long week, had a lot on my mind, so anyway. Uh, but anyway, what I know about what's on those DVDs, no matter what I'm talking about, it's going to have a lot of Bible verses on it. And the one thing I believe in above everything else in this world is that the Word of God does what nobody else can do. It is quick, which means it's alive. And it is powerful. And it can do things in somebody's life that you don't think can be done, but it can do things. And if you don't believe that, just go out and drop a seed in the ground and watch what happens. Because that's a book, just like the Bible's a book, and it's the seed, and you don't have to tell. When you plant tulip bulbs in the ground, you don't have to say, now I command thee to grow, and I believe in faith that you will, in Jesus' name. You don't have to do that. It'll do it. That's the way the Word of God is. Amen. Uh, we've been talking about uh, bondage, chains of bondage, and people that have problems. And um, there are some people that I have in mind this morning that have some problems, that uh, they are, have some chains in their life. And so far, God has not completely delivered them from those chains. Some of you may know who I'm talking about. The rest of you may not know who I'm talking about. It doesn't matter. It could be anybody. It could be somebody here that nobody would know that you have a chain of bondage that God has not delivered you from yet. But... I believe that God is in the deliverance business, or I would not be here today. So let's start. I'm just going to basically just do what I've been doing the last couple Sundays on this. I'm just teaching the Word of God, but I've got a particular way I'm going to take it this morning. So let's get into it. Psalm 79 verse 9, Bible says, Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of thy name, and deliver us, and then purge away our sins and we kind of talked about that before God doesn't purge sins all at once one and then another and then another and then another God is the husbandman of the vine we are the we are that we're the branch of that vine and God knows best what to take away from us first and then what to take away from us last. God always knows best. But he'll do it for his name's sake. Verse 10. Wherefore should the heathen say, where is their God? 
Let him be known among the heathen in our sight by the revenging the blood of thy servants which is shed. Let the sighing of the prisoner come before thee according to the greatness of thy power. Preserve thou those that are appointed to die. Let the sighing of the prisoner come before thee. And those of you who are in chains of bondage this morning, God's hearing you sighing. God's not abandoned you. God's not turned his back on you. But remember what I said a while ago. They that wait on the Lord. Uh, verse 12. Render unto our neighbors sevenfold into their bosom their reproach. Wherewith they have reproached thee, O Lord. Because some people have, because you have a chain of bondage in your life. There are people who have spoken evil of you. Like. What are you doing in church? Well, you're the one that belongs here. If you're a prisoner and you have chains of bondage and you have wounds, you're the one that needs to be here. Not the ones who cry out against those who have chains. Render unto our neighbor sevenfold into their bosom their reproach wherewith they have reproached thee, O Lord. So we thy people and the sheep of thy pasture will give thee thanks forever. We will show forth thy praise to all generations. At the end of your life, I promise you, it will not be a testimony of what you did for yourself. It will be the testimony of what God did for you. Amen. Turn to Psalm 102, and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. And I'll show you where I'm going with this. Heavenly Father, we love you, and we thank you for being so kind to us. We thank you, God, for long-suffering with us. Father, there are people who, who are saved. No doubt in my mind about it. But to this day, there are some things in their life that they've asked you, God, repeatedly to take away from them. You have not done so. And maybe others have told them, well, obviously you're not saved. Maybe their own, maybe the devil's told them they're not going to heaven, so just give up, just just turn back to the old, old person you used to be and eat, drink, and be merry. You're going to die and go to hell anyway, so don't, don't, give, don't try it. Don't. But Father, you are a very merciful God. You're in the saving, delivering, purging business. And Father, I would like for people to understand the things, God, that you've done in my life. I, this is, I know, Lord, how you work. Because this is how you've done it in me. The Father, I pray, dear God, that you give the prisoners hope. And Father, for each one of us that are prisoners or have been prisoners, for us to tell you thank you for that. Because while we were in prison, we met other prisoners. Father, bless your word this morning. Help me to preach it. And Father, once again, I just want to tell you thank you for what you helped me with this week. I did not deserve that. But you did it for me anyway. And Lord, I give you all the praise and all the glory. Thank you for my wife. Continue to bless her this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, look at Psalm 102. When the Lord shall build up Zion, think of, think of this church as Zion. This is the, the house of God, the city of God, the people of God. We're the people of God. When the Lord shall build up Zion, He shall appear in His glory. And what I want out of this church 
is for when people who come here for the first time, I want them to know that they've been in the presence of God. Not because we did a bunch of wild stuff in the floor. Not because we had a fog machine and a drum and a big light show and a bunch of praise worship band on the thing and we put on a big dog and pony show not for that reason that's not God but I want them to know that they've been in the presence of God because they've been in the presence of God's people and where God's people are they are the tabernacle of God they are the house of God and that's where God is so verse 17 he will regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise their prayer. So here's what I want you to understand. You can be saved, born again, but be in bondage to something. You can be saved 5 years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. Be in bondage to something. Sister Hazel Waymire and Sister Bernice Whitehead. Those ladies, as blessed as they were, they were part of this church for years. I've known them for years. I've, I, I've watched them. I've watched their life. I'm just going, these are, these are the godly ladies. You know what they would tell you? So we get on our knees and we ask God's forgiveness every day for our sins. And you're thinking, you're 88 years old. What are you doing wrong? And you're not out smoking marijuana, are you? You're not out drinking. So what? But they... They knew their sins. When did God finally deliver them from all of them? The day they drew their last breath here. And then God delivered them from every one of them. So he will regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise their prayer. This shall be written for the generation to come and for the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. For he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary and from heaven did the Lord behold the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoner to loose those that are appointed to death. He hears the groaning of the prisoner. He heard the groaning of the Israelites when they were under the taskmasters in Egypt. He heard their groaning and God sent them a savior. I said this a while ago, they, they may not have ever asked for a deliverer, but God sent them one anyway. Now, I, I said a while ago, you know, before we took up our offering, you know, God, we thank you for blessings, most of which we never even asked for. I mean, we have money, we've got a house. We've got clothes, we've got food, we've got things that we have not asked God for, but God has given them to us anyway. That's how good God is. So, verse 21, um, verse 20, to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to loose those that are appointed to death, to declare the name of the Lord in Zion and, praises, and praise in Jerusalem. When the people are gathered together in the kingdoms to serve the Lord, he, watch this, verse 23, he weakened my strength in the way, he shortened my days. I said, oh my God, take me not away in the midst of my days, thy years are throughout all generations. And God, I've said this before, I said it last Sunday, God will weaken our strength. But here's, here's what I want you to understand this morning. Turn to Acts chapter 16. Why would God, why would God allow somebody who is saved, born again, child of the living God, why would God allow you every now and then to get involved in something that's wrong? Why would God do that? Does God do that? I, I believe He does. Obviously, because who in here, since you've been saved, has never done anything wrong? Well, that ain't nobody. So obviously, it happened, and obviously God allowed it. But He allowed it for a reason. 
So I have that up there on the screen. God just might make you one of them. And what I'm talking about is one of those prisoners. And you look at Acts chapter 16. Look at verse 19. When her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas, drew them out into the marketplace under the rulers, and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them. The magistrates rent off their clothes, commanded to beat them. Now we're talking about Paul and Silas. They took Paul and Silas, stripped them in front of everybody, and beat them. And then verse 23, And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Here's Paul, and Paul, Paul, the greatest Bible teacher, preacher, greatest evangelist, greatest church planner, greatest disciple, the greatest Bible writer, the greatest of all God's people. God allowed him to go into prison. God allowed him to be held in chains of bondage. They put him in stocks, which means literally they fastened their feet and their arms. And prisons are, are not like prisons in America. They're, they were dungeons. Musty, nasty, dirty, rat infested, feces everywhere. Where you were was your toilet. And that's where Paul and Silas was sitting there. And look at verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. See, God put them to be with other prisoners. Are you catching this? So let me tell you about me. A couple years ago, I told you this during homecoming. They put me on Percocets because I had a bad back. Since I've had the surgery, don't need the Percocets no more. But they don't tell you. Now there's big lawsuits everywhere. Now all these pharmaceutical companies are getting caught in what they were doing. They were giving kickbacks to the doctors to prescribe Percocets to everybody. Telling everybody, oh, these are harmless. No, they're not. No, they're not. And I got hooked on those things. And I'm having a test run now. I don't know the, the results. But one doctor thinks that my body, you know, for you to take two Tylenol, it takes me like 20. And that's just my, that's my system. They're doing a, a check on my system because they think that's how my body is anyway. If you take two ibuprofen, I'll take 15 of them. And it's that with practically everything. So I end up taking 10 Percocets at a time. 10 milligram Percocets. 100 milligram Percocet. Just to get by. Okay? So my doctor then realizes what's going on. So... They're going to get me off of those, and there's a way they do that, and I'm not going to get into all that. But, and I'm just going, God, why did you let, why did you let this happen? I'm angry. I'm angry. At, as part of the insurance program, I had to go to a clinic. And three days a week, for two hours, I had to sit with other drug addicts. So where am I? I'm in prison with other prisoners. And God's showing me, Mike, I want you to go through this because I want you to know what other people go through. And I said, God, I'll do this. So for six weeks, two hours a day, three days a week, 
I sat at a table with drug addicts and alcoholics. And I listened to them and I listened to their story. And it just so happened the guy that, that led that went to Bible college like, like I did and was a Christian. And he made it a point to tell everybody in every group that I was a preacher. See, I wanted to hide. But I think he knew what he was doing. When I got done with my six-week course, they all said, hey, it's Mike's last day. Hey. And they went around the table, and every one of them said, we have never met anybody like you. We've heard things, because when people would come up with something, I would say, and I always had permission from the guy leading it, because he went to Bible college, I always say, can I bring the Bible? He said, sure, bring the Bible into it. And every time somebody had something, I would say, let me tell you what the Bible says about that. And I don't regret sitting across the table from those dope addicts and those drunks. Some of them didn't make it. Some of them, some of them they would be there for a while. Found out they were out doing heroin again, doing meth again. One guy that I kind of, he kind of, he really liked me. On my last day, I drove down the road, and he was walking down the road. I offered to pick him up, and he said, no, I'd rather walk. And the group leader called me and said, his name was Matt, and said, Matt, we've had to put him in the hospital. On his way out of that group, he stopped and got a bottle of vodka, and he was drunk by the time you saw him there on the road. We had to put him in the hospital. And he asked me to call him and talk to him because he knew that the guy liked me. I've stayed in touch with him over the years. Here's what I'm telling you people. Why did God put Paul and Silas down there with those prisoners? To give prisoners hope. When Jesus hung on the cross and he said it is finished, where did he go? Where did he go? He went to the lower parts of the earth to preach deliverance to the captives in prison. Here's what I'm saying to you. God just might make you a prisoner. God just might allow you to have chains of bondage in your life. So that as God delivers you out of it, and He shows you how He does that, turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 6. First Corinthians 6. Verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. We all say amen to that, right? Amen. Verse 11. And such were some of you. Now you look at that list. Are you or have you been something on that list? I'm here, little amens all over the building. 
There's a big, big one standing there. I'm just telling you, some was up to you, but you're washed, but you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And I forgot to put this verse in my notes. Somebody might be able to help me out with where it is. But Paul talked about where, how God comforts us. We then have the ability then to take and use what God did for us to be a blessing to somebody else who's now where we used to be. Amen? So you wondered why. I've been in church all my life and I did this and I did that. Why God did you, why did you let me go through that God? God, why did you? Now sometimes God uses that stuff to filter out the people who are not really saved to begin with. They're going to be gone no matter what. But there are people who are saved, born again, and church members, and sitting among us, or sitting watching online, who have little things going on in their life that they don't want anybody to find out about. But they ask for deliverance. What I'm going to tell you is, God's going to do, give you deliverance, and as He's doing it, and then after He does it, he can use you then to deliver somebody else who's just like you are. Wouldn't it be worth it? So when you tell me, man, I've been hooked on drugs, I know a little bit about that. Now, you, when you tell me, man, I, I, I'm a drunk, I'm an alcoholic. I don't know anything about that, but I know there's a guy back here who does. And there may be some others in our church that you don't know about that know something about it, that need help. And I'm still, I've still got it in my mind, in my heart, that we, once a week, have a meeting where people who have any kind of issue in life can come and sit at a table with other people who have had or are having issues. And let's go through the Word of God and let's let the Word of God bring healing and blessing to their life. And let's watch as God delivers them Slowly but surely. Remember when I started preaching all this, I said, what if I told you that we're going to start a program, we're going to guarantee people with addicts, who, with addictions, that we're going to guarantee them that within 70 years, God will deliver them from that, from that problem. 70 years. Because I figured anybody who comes, they may live 70 more years on this earth, but eventually they'll die. And when they die, then God will del have delivered them from all of these problems. You're going to have to deal with sin the rest of your life. Wouldn't it be best to deal with it God's way with a group of other sinners who are there to help you? There's somebody who's been coming to this church that's not here today because the devil's reached out and tried to pull them back. And I ain't about to give up on them. If they're not going to give up on themselves, I'm not going to give up on them either. So, Guess what? It's not even 12 o'clock. I just feel like I'm done preaching today. Amen. <laughs> no, that's, that's what I wanted to say to you. I, I, I think... I think that's what we need to do. I'm going to let my wife get healed up. 
but I, I had this in my mind when that man I told you about, his name is Matt. I still have him in my phone. I can call him anytime. Matt, how you doing? Because his heart was drawn toward me. And I had it in my mind. I even ran it by him years ago. I said, you know, Matt, I'm thinking about, as a minister, just opening up our church to help people with the Word of God. Again, it's not going to be modeled after what everybody else's program is. We're just going to sit down, talk, and let the Word of God give us deliverance and give us help. And I hope that there's somebody in this area that's doing drugs that comes into this place because they want help. That's who I hope we find. So I'm going to ask you this morning, if you would, to just, I want us to pray. So if you would, just bow your head. This, and this morning, you know, I, sometimes I do altar calls, sometimes I don't. And it's just me, I just quit trying to sell instantaneous results to every sermon I preached. I'm more now about long term. Yes, if you want to come and pray and ask God for something this morning, you're more than welcome to it. But sometimes I'm more interested in what I see coming out of you 10 years from now than I am this morning. So I want us to pray as a church. That God will lead me with the format, how to do it, that to make sure that it's God's idea. God, if it's God's idea, he, He'll bless it. We won't even have to ask Him to bless it. It'll be His idea. He'll bless it. But that God will... Allow us as a church to find some very, very lost people who need Jesus to save them from what's got a hold of them. Like he did us. Like he did us. Father, I come before you today and I thank you, God, for... Allowing me to share with these people my life. Some things I tell them, some things I don't, Father. But again, God, I thank you that you did not make me better than the people who come here. You made me as the people who come here. And I promised you a long time ago, God, that I would not try to hide who I really was. Because I think, Father, that yes, there are some self-righteous people who don't want any part of that. But Father I know for a fact. Because I've met them. I've met the people. Who would give anything. To be delivered. By you. Out of the life of sin. That they're in. And Father some of the people that. Need that deliverance are sitting in this room today. And I pray, dear God, that you'd always make them to understand that there isn't anything that they have done that they cannot go to you as the Father 
that you are to them and ask for your forgiveness and you will forgive them because you are Father and we are your children. And you may chasten us, you may chastise us, you may use a rod of correction on us, but that's because you love us and that's your way of changing us into who you want us to be. Father, I pray, Lord, for our church that, God, you would show us what to do, how to do it, when to do it, and then bring us the people who need the help. Let us become the hospital for the sick and the dying. So, Father, I ask your blessings now upon this church, upon these people, I thank you, God, for letting me meet the prisoners and for showing forth your praise in everything that I do. Bless those, Lord, who need it the most. Use us for your kingdom and your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand to your feet this morning?